Hello and welcome to episode seven of the Make Things Better podcast. Today I have Cam Spillman from Paper on the show to talk to us about Paper's principles. So thanks a lot for coming on, Cam. How are you doing today? All right. Thanks, Tom. Thanks very much for ha- having me on. Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. How are you? Yeah. Cheers, coming. Yeah. Cheers for coming on. And yeah, I'm I'm good. Thanks. Looking forward to talking a little bit more about these principles. And we had a chat about. Uh, this a few weeks ago and you know we're kind of getting into the whole philosophy behind it and it just kind of piqued my interest so hopefully it'll be a fairly interesting podcast Um, my first question then is how did paper start and how was it founded because I know you are one of the three founders right that's right Uh, there's myself uh, another two people called Mark and John and um, we founded paper about uh, just over five years ago now, to be a user research and design studio to specialise in that. Um, for anyone who, who doesn't know, user research is doing research to understand what people need from a service or a product. Uh, and design can take many forms, um, right from you know designing uh, how something that you interact with it, what the content is in that, right up to what the strategy is for delivering it, what the policies are, the processes. So when we talk about design, maybe we're thinking more f- how something works and maybe less about how something is aesthetically, if that makes sense. So yeah, the, the, the three of us founded it five years ago um, on the back of, we, we'd known each other for about 10 years, I think, um, uh, but we've just done a project together. We'd all come back together to do a project with an airport. And um, they asked us to go in and do research and design to understand what the needs would be of people traveling to and from an airport uh, and to figure out how to like connect everything. So if you think about it, if you go into an airport, you want to know what, what when your flight is, uh, how you're going to get there, um, what facilities there are there, if you're in a family, like, you know, uh, uh, good facilities for kids, that sort of thing. Um, so a lot of that you do via the web, but then it's got a physical part to it as well. And they realized they needed to connect those two things. Anyway, we had a really good time doing that and thinking about it. You can imagine there's loads of really interesting challenges with that stuff. But the, the outcome of that was that they'd kind of already made a load of technology choices that sort of constrained our thinking. They'd, they'd, they'd made those choices before we sort of got into it, if you like. And we realized that what we needed to do was create a separate thing that just did research and design before anyone makes big choices or big commitments to, to technology. Um, so that was sort of the, the beginning of it. And you mentioned these principles before. That's, that's what we did. We sat down and we thought about what the principles are of a, a good modern research and design studio before we had a name or even the concept that it might be um, you know our business we were just interested in like there, there must be some way of improving this situation so that's where we started yeah that's a quite an interesting background to it and it's interesting to hear that like it's the research that kind of can um, often it can be the research that needs to come first before all of the other choices are made Um, we'll go for what are paper's main principles first and then we'll move on to where they came from afterwards yeah okay cool Uh, that makes sense so if you you put put yourself back in our shoes like five years ago we were really writing a list of stuff that we were like um the stuff that we'd seen gone wrong in other places and and also stuff that we aspired to and we hoped for so I think that list, like, we just loads of sentences, like 18 of them, like, wouldn't it be good to just, just work with nice people, for instance, exactly like you say, wouldn't it be good if you just, just meet nice people and you work? So we started with that. And eventually what we got down to was for what we called principles, because what we understand principles to be are the sort of foundation. So before we had a name for the business, before anything else, we said, what, what are the four things that if, if you do nothing else, you, you do these four things? Um, and they were, we value our principles uh, more than money. We value leg ups and free work um, as much as paid work. We invest our profit back into the business in the form of R&D. 
and that we're self-funded and independent. So that those are the four um, founding principles that we, we, we've kept to this day. Yeah, okay. And um, am I right thinking that there was something to do with, because those principles ensure that you're quite sustainable, there's something about like having, was it like enough resources for the next six months as well or something like that? That's right. So that, that top principle, well, um, at Faye, who, who's one of our team, calls the MAMA principle, which I absolutely love. It really is. Is um, We value our principles more than money. And I think it, it, if you look at that, that can sound quite flippant, like we just don't care about money. But that but that's not true. We, we were absolutely skinned when we started uh, paper. Money was, um, you know, something we really had to worry about. What, what we mean by that is we knew that um, it can all, money can also make you make compromised decisions. Um, so for instance, you know, if you skin like we were in the first year and we need work and we're, we're, we're uh, figuring out how we're going to pay the rent and someone comes along with a project as they did and said, um, would you do this work? And it wasn't the type of work we wanted to do. Going back to, we just wanted to do research and design and they were asking us for something else. Having those principles written down from the start made it easier for us to turn that work down, even though we, know, we knew it, it, we might struggle to pay the rent the following month or, or, or whatever. So that, that, that's, that's what I mean about um, we're, not, we're not flippant when we, when we talk about that. And then how that's affected us as a, a business, if, if people are interested in that. Like, um, it means we think about how we grow. So we, at any one time at paper, there, there's a team of uh, nine people, but we've often got like upwards of 30, maybe partners, freelancers working with us on projects. And one way you could look at that is, well, why, why don't we have 30 employees then rather than uh, freelancers? But the reason that we don't is so that we can save money, make sure that we can sustain ourselves if all the work disappeared tomorrow. Let's say there's a global pandemic or something, although that wasn't the outcome of that. But anyway, you know, some unforeseen event. Can we make sure that we, we can all be comfortable so that we can wait for the right, right piece of work to come along? And, and, and no one's worried about it. So we value our principles more than money is actually about having a healthy sort of respect for money and how it can affect your choices. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I guess then you don't have quite as much responsibility in a way for you know all 30 people because as you say, like they're, they're freelance um, or they're not actually under, they're not relying on you. That's the main thing, right? Um, that's a whole other really interesting topic. I, I, I really love that topic. I think it is a different relationship to people who are employed. Um, but actually, the, the way that we work with our freelancers and partners, because we, because we specialise, so we'll always need to work with partners, right? So we've had to invest a lot of time uh, thinking about, well, how do we have proper, meaningful working relationships? Like, someone just turns up having never worked with paper, how do they know how we work? How do they know how we like to interact, that sort of thing? So we, we're we just about to do a talk on this with Manchester Digital actually on, um, on the 28th uh, about when we work with freelancers and partners, we start paying them straight away for their time. That's one thing. Just get, get that money thing out of the way uh, again, straight away. And then, pretty much the rest of the process is similar to how someone who works at paper would work. We, we write things called um, user guides. They're a really useful way of talking about how you like to work, um, what, what situations would make you anxious, what sort of situations you look for, how you like communication to work, those sort of things. So actually we, we try and, I, th I think the effect is that we work just like we would with our, our team that's employed. They, they, it just happens to have a different commercial model and those people have the freedom then to go and pick, you know, to uh, other jobs and work with other people, which again, benefits us ultimately. Yeah, that's really yes. cool. And I imagine having those, kind of like building up those relationships and caring for those people a little bit more, um, does that lead to them kind of like coming back to you and you working with them more often in the future as well? Yeah. 
Uh, I, I think so without, you know, without blowing our, our own horn, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think that's the feedback we've got. And it seems really genuine that people are really keen to, to work with us because unfortunately, I, I, I think not every business treats people a, 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 as well when they're freelancing, that they do treat them more like uh, less people and more just someone to come and do a thing and then disappear. Um, yeah, so yeah, it, in answer to your question, it, it does seem to work out like that. I, I don't know why anyone wouldn't, you know, but they don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an interesting one. I think, I guess one of the main reasons why your uh, like paper may treat them like that is because at the heart of paper it does seem like as i was saying earlier about the type of people who are in this sort of field of uh design and research and the, that kind of field you need people who can build up relationships and understand people it's about people right that's one of the fundamental things and um, I seem to be understanding so far. Anyway, I'm very new to all of this. I've only really been in this kind of field for probably like four or five months, or at least talking to people in this field, because I'm not really, I'm just like uh, more of a social media marketing kind of guy right now. But um, whereas like with another company where it's less focused on people and maybe more focused on transactions, like, I don't know, going to like KFC or something, they're maybe not going to care so much about their delivery or uber um, drivers who come in and collect food um, because it's all very transactional and people are not at the center of it but I guess with paper am I right in thinking that because people are at the very very center that kind of like spreads out it's almost like pervasive throughout the whole um, just just everything that you do right yeah yeah, I, I, I don't think I could say it better than you, Tom. I think you're spot on. It's, it's about putting people first. Um, it, it, in my mind, often what you're, what you're really doing is slowing things down to take the time to build a relationship and understand um, uh, other people's perspectives and to build empathy and those sort of things. And also to think long term. So sometimes, uh, you know, Going back to turning down work, for instance, that that can you know make people feel sort of rejected if you if you turn down a project. And we've been in a situation before where we we, we said no to something just because we didn't think we had the time to do it as well as we wanted. But over the long term, that 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 client actually came back to us. I think it was a whole year later, and at that point, it sort of got to the point where they they understood why we'd made the decision we had and really wanted to work with us again and we could at that point so it's just taking a long-term approach understanding that you know in the short term if it feels like a challenging decision that doesn't mean you should duck it it's worth taking the time to get things right yeah absolutely i think i read that example on your website or you might be on about another one but there was an example on the website i'm sure where there was some work and it maybe didn't fit with what you were doing at the time and so uh, you chose not to um, do that work and then yeah as you say a year later or whenever they come back and then I think that it, it was an even bigger project as well um, the, part, the example I'm thinking of that was on the website anyway so that's that's really cool and I think they probably respected you even more as well for kind of turning down that initial work because you know maybe it just wasn't where you were at at that point for, for whatever reason. That's it no yeah we're talking about the same example yeah there, there are biggest client now <laughs> it's funny how things turn out isn't it? Yeah. yeah yeah that's awesome that's a that's a really cool example of um why you should maybe sometimes focus on the long term rather than the short term um has there been any challenges at all in terms of adhering to these main principles yeah um well it's also about you know um sending down work uh, and that that's challenging especially if you skin, you need you need you need some money coming in. Um, there's there's quite a few. So I haven't really talked through the other principles and how they work. Like um, so, uh, another one is about how we uh, reinvest our profit into what we call R and D. And the result of that is that um, everyone at Paper um, works on client work four days a week, and they have one day a week where they can work on their own projects or products or, or, or whatever. Um, there's a few uh, agencies doing that sort of thing. I, I think we do it slightly differently in, 
maybe we'll talk about that later, but one of the challenges with that is to then to explain to clients who work maybe a five day week why we work four days a week and what the benefit is to them. Um, so having those sort of conversations, again, when you sort of at that very early stage and getting to know each other and you're like, we want it to be smooth and for us to not feel like, oh, these are going to be really difficult. But at the same time, you need to sort of set out, no, here's who we are. This is why you've chosen to work with us. You see the value in what we do and our skills and capabilities. But as it happens, the way that we've managed to get to that level is by working in this way. So four day a week means for us, um, we can dedicate our time, do one thing, do it really well for four days a week, but you get a day, which is a bit of a reprieve. So you're still in a work environment, but you can think about something that you're passionate about, that you're sort of trucking along with in the background, that sort of thing, and, and, and get away from the, the client work. As it happens, everyone who's worked with us from a client point of view, it's worked out really well for them because they're kidding themselves if they ever thought they were going to do five days a week purely on our projects. They're, you know, running their government department or, or, or running their business or whatever. So actually having a day when they can do all of that other work that still exists work, works out really well. But sometimes it can be when you talk about challenge, it's a challenge at first to get people to go, oh, maybe we could think differently about this on this occasion. Yeah. So I guess that communication initially is probably really important with your clients so that they can understand you and then you can understand them as well. Um, so what sort of stuff are people getting up to on that? Uh, day off well not day off I shouldn't say that but um, the day when you're not focusing exclusively on clients yeah I mean it's fine to call it a day off if, if if people want to just use it just to like not even do work things um, everyone at paper is independent self-organizing they, they, they can choose how, how they want to work what they want to work on and stuff so there's no it, it's not strictly you must be doing an R&D project um I'm trying to think of stuff we've done in the past uh, because some of the stuff we're doing at the moment can't necessarily talk about it yet. Um, but uh, I don't, yeah, we, so some of it has become work related. So um, people have had a problem on projects like um, when we do research, we have to take consent from participants and there wasn't sort of a slick way of doing that. There wasn't a product out there to do that. So we just designed our own our own product really that paper uses now for all consent process processes and has since been adopted by um, one government department and a few businesses that we work with as well so that's a good example of like a little mini project that turned into a thing that that went outside the other big thing is, that happened really early on is we developed a, an event called leg up social which is a separate thing to paper um, it's a free to attend digital mentoring event. Uh, originally, it was for charities, small businesses and uh, social enterprises, but it expanded beyond that. It, it turned out anyone who was just sort of really struggling with digital um, uh, could come along because all we wanted to do was help. And the, the way it works is that people from the digital community volunteer their time to mentor people on digital skills. Um, um, and it all works because people are willing to volunteer. And actually, at least one of our first, first volunteers was um, someone from Hive IT, thankfully. So that's, that's, that's a good example, I think, of it doesn't have to be a business or a product or something like that. It could just be anything but you're just not thinking about your client problem. You, you're thinking about a different problem and that's, it's somehow it's just, it's quite healthy for your brain to do that. Oh yeah, definitely. It can be like really refreshing to uh, take your mind off certain things. I know when I'm sort of just like on a personal level, like if I'm really stuck in writing a particular case study or whatever it may be, um, if I go out for like a walk or I just have a day off and, you know shift my focus to something else when you go back to that work that you were working on previously you can maybe think of new ideas or new ways of looking at things and yeah as you say that can be really healthy um do you think that's like your your subconscious doing some of the work in the background Tom? yeah maybe it could be um talking about the subconscious this is completely off topic but <laughs> it's quite yeah this is this is going to be a weird one but i've been listening to these uh 
it's a bit weird. I've not shared this with anyone yet, actually. So you're the first person I've told this to. But the last two nights, I was listening to these like success, like whatever that means. Obviously, it's different for everyone. But they were like these success manifestations of um, subconscious kind of videos, like just before I went to sleep. And what I found really interesting about it was the last two nights, I had dreams that were both kind of really focused on my like longer term goals so in one of them I, I had my camera up that I just got for my birthday and I was like taking photos with my friends and stuff which is a little bit to do with what I want to do and I can't remember last night's one anymore but I remember waking up in the night and being like whoa that was weird like another dream about like kind of success for me like what that is for me and yeah that was really weird but um I just thought I'd bring that up briefly <laughs> yeah but so is that good do you is that good that you're dreaming about success things is that uh, yeah I, I think so um as I say like I, I don't really like the word success because it's what it is today like in society it's a bit I don't know I think most people's a lot of people's idea of success is like money and stuff that doesn't align with my values not everyone obviously and not most yeah. people I know or kind of in this field but a lot of people um but yeah, it was it was really interesting. You you, you said it before that the word about sustainability when we talk about our principles. That when we talk about success, that's what we're, we we often talk about. It that it's almost interchangeable for us. So if you can sustain sustain something, if you can make sure that what you take is, is um, less than uh, um, what 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 you give, sort of thing, then that. That would be successful for us if we if we can just continue to do that and then when growth comes into it then it's a different question you're not talking about growth to acquire more to get more money or to get more projects or whatever you're talking about well does this make us more sustainable and does that give you the opportunity to give more and take less as well am i right yeah yeah exactly okay yeah that's a really cool definition actually of success so I think anyone could use that like on an individual level and as a business if you can be sustainably and consistently providing more than you're taking that's success yeah. that's a well, neutral you know but yeah if you just if you're just trying to acquire more and eventually sure uh, this is all a bit philosophical in it but eventually it's, it's just going to feel a bit pointless like where, where are you trying to get to with that <laughs> yeah yeah that's really cool i like that definition like give, give yeah give more than you take sustainably um be in a position to be able to do that that's cool um anyway moving on <laughs> um but yeah that is an interesting topic so on the kind of like individually like members of staff how on board are they with the principles like how much do you actually talk about these um these four principles that that guide the decisions and do you think it helps them as well to have that kind of ethical side of things right yeah um and so we we, we talk about our principles sort of front and center so at, at every uh conversation we have whether it's with um yeah someone who might be joining the team or um a, a partner that we might want to work with or a client it, we we bring them up um because i think it's the best way of understanding us um and, and getting to what's different uh, about us so I, I feel like people know about them straight away for the team though as well i talked about people being self-organizing uh, 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 the principles are really helpful in that regard because if, if you just if you say to someone right it's day one uh, there's loads of things you could do but you decide you've got freedom to decide we trust you to to, to make your decisions for yourself and most people uh, myself included have come from structures where we were told what to do by um you know what do you call them like line managers or whatever so in, in those situations what the principles do really helpfully is they do set out a bit of guidance. So they're not saying you, this is what you must do, but it's saying like, you're, you're going to make some choices for yourself. But if you're unsure, if you're faced with a choice, maybe refer back to these principles. And principles alone don't do that, that you need to then put in place governance and process that backs them up. Um, 
I think a good example of that. So that that first principle, we value our principles more than money. That's tied to a, a set of a process and paper called the qualification process, which is how we qualify the projects that we are going to choose or not choose to work on. And it's just a list of questions that you have to answer yes to. So, as, for example, um, do we think um, we're going to learn something new on this project? If you answer no to that question, we don't do it. If you answer yes, we do. Do we think they're going to be nice to work with? You know, yes or no. And then one of those is actually, and this is always a fun discussion, is it ethically and morally something that we want to work on? So those questions exist, they're available to anyone who works at paper. So anyone at paper can look at a new project, a new brief, and they can choose whether they want to look at it, they can choose whether they want to work on it, but they know that guidance, those principles are there. So I think, you know, yes, they're aware of them when they join paper, but more importantly, those four principles aren't just written words on a page, they stretch all the way down into how, how, how the business sort of operates day to day. Yeah, that's really cool because I've worked for like, I've, I worked for like a kind of private company for a little while. And I think they had a, you know, a big sort of mission statement that you get in, you know, the quarterly newsletter or whatever. Um, and you see it scattered around in, in emails or any sort of, marketing type of stuff but it was like it just wasn't part of any of the processes like what we actually did in that company did not really align with that mission statement um so it's interesting to hear that you've actually got your your principles in place and then the actual processes to ensure that everything you do is in alignment with those principles um how many questions are there like how many things do you have to tick on the qualification list because i think that is quite interesting i've never heard of yeah. that before and i think at hive it we're very similar in terms of the sort of work we do it's just less um it's still less objectively i'd say i, I feel like I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure i've not worked at hive probably long enough to say but from my experience so far it seems like decisions are made kind of just based on um based on our knowledge at the time of like okay do you, do we think you know we're going to learn from this uh, is this company ethical and obviously we've had many situations where i think we've uh, probably turned down work as well when we thought yeah that probably doesn't align with our values um but yeah it's cool to hear that your sort of uh, methods um that you have in place uh, so like a bit more structured i think and that sounds quite rare as well i don't know many companies uh, i've not heard of any companies who have something like that in place that is really cool I think that that comes from the self-organization part as well. So uh, me, Mark and John, when we started, wrote down some qualification questions and some of them still exist in that list. But I know that it's at least gone through one iteration led by, I think it was Rachel, who um, is a user researcher at Paper, who, who saw an opportunity to improve them and chose to do that. But it's that thing about that none of these things, so in fact, I talked about Faye before talking about the MAMA principle. The reason that Faye was thinking about the MAMA principle is that she's thinking about ways to better describe our principles and potentially add new ones as well. So that everything's up for grabs if you've got a team of people who you trust and uh, um, uh, are given the time and space to look at these things. You asked about how many. Um, the, yeah, I don't know. I've just got them up in front of me. But if you want some more examples, like there's, um, do we have the right skills to do the job? Uh, have, oh, this is a good one. Have we got a better way to do it than what they've already described? Because it, it's quite easy to look at a brief and just go, yeah, we could do that. But how could we actually do something better than what they've described? Um, how about this then, one? Um, well, can we, like, as far as we know, can we do this better than anyone else? Because what about if there's a situation when there's like a potential competitor who you think are more qualified to do a job? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's kind of in there, but we don't think of it like that. Um, I talked about before how we, because we specialise, we depend on partners. So we've got a, a question that says, do, do we need help from a freelancer or a partner to do this? Um, do we bring something of value to that partner or freelancer? So it, it's less about competitors and more about if we've got what we think is the best way of doing this, 
what sort of team of people should we pull together to do it? That's good. I like that. And yeah, maybe one day high by T and people work together on something as well because yeah, we've tried. I'd love to. Um, there's so many fab people at Hive, and um, I know I know the founders. And where myself, Mark, and John met um, was at the same company that the founders of Hive met as well. Funnily enough, ah, a, right. an agency in Sheffield that, um, for reasons, doesn't exist anymore. But actually, lots of people went from that agency and did did fab things. I think it's they had an amazing leadership team there. And you've got people like um, Chris Diamond, who um, is one of the founders of the Sheffield Digital Network. You've got Saul Cousins, who's currently doing some really interesting work in the University of Sheffield. They, they, they were part of the leadership team there. Uh, Emma Marshall, who's at Free Squared. Free Squared is this incredible agency um, focused on sort of technology solutions for rail. All came from this one place. It was just a bit of a a melting pot of, of, of talent and inspiring people really. yeah it's really cool to hear that because i've asked a little bit about the background to hive and um is it technophobia right is that the name that's right yeah 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 i ne never really liked the name <laughs> 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 yeah <laughs> yeah um yeah so it is an odd name um given the work that they did but yeah i actually asked my dad um because my dad has lived in Sheffield for 30 years or whatever. And I mentioned to him technophobia. And yeah, it turned out he'd actually done some work with technophobia like 15 years ago as well. Yeah. So yeah, it's such a, it's a small world. And uh, you know, a few of those names you just mentioned I've heard of before. And I think we're hopefully gonna have Chris Diamond on the podcast at some point as well. So that would be a cool one. Anyway, I think that's it for today. I've kind of gone on a few tangents at uh, my <laughs> points. I mean, I've been bringing up my dreams and friends, so I apologise for that. But yeah, you've been, a, you've been an awesome guest. So uh, thanks for coming on, Cam. I, I really enjoyed it, especially the tangents. Um, <laughs> just, uh, yeah, thanks for having me, man. I, I really appreciate it. It's been lovely. Um, it's been lovely getting to know you, uh, Tom. And uh, uh, thank you very much for giving me the space to chat about principles and whatnot it's not often i get to do it right, in this yeah yeah well so. thanks for coming on and um actually my final question before we go because this is a question that i like to ask every guest and i've not prepped you for this at all so i really do apologize in advance um but what do you think people can do to make things better because this is the make things better podcast and right. I love asking people this question because I get such a range of answers and a lot of them kind of come out of just like they're so individual to different people. Um, so, yeah, I've kind of uh, talked on a little bit there to hopefully give you some time to think of an answer. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> when, when, yeah. when you're ready, what can people do to make things better in the world? Um, oh, wow. In the world. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't that that. That is a, big, a really big question. I, I think I spend a lot of time trying to think about how, how to look for the good in people. I just not, so, so maybe it's along those lines. It's like, don't assume anyone is um, uh, not good. I was going to use a different word then. Try, try and find the good, good in people. And um, oh yeah, and, and take your neighbor's parcels as well. I think that's that's one way to make the world a better place, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> love that thank you um we tend to get actually quite a lot of like bigger um answers like the first one like um you know see the good in people and then we've also had a few um like really good like mini tips as well like i remember one person the answer was like just go on a walk but record yourself talking before the walk and then listen back so you can like hear your thoughts and it's kind of a really cool way of journaling so that was really interesting as well um the other thing on like judging the first thing that sprung to my mind when you said um be like be nice to people and uh, maybe don't um assume or, or judge them straight away is obviously I'm probably going to need people to treat me like that over the next few weeks with with this haircut because there's certain misconceptions and uh I don't want any trouble with anybody so yeah we'll see how that goes as well um all right thanks so much for coming on Cam you've been a great guest and thank you to everyone listening this has been the make things better podcast we had Cam on this show where can people find you or paper Cam um well, yeah, 
paper may, maybe on twitter is the best place um it's at paper sheffield uh, i'm on twitter too if anyone wants to say hello um uh, at cam spillman so those are probably the best places awesome thanks a lot and i hope everyone has a great rest of their day <laughs>